Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the Legends podcast on this beautiful April day, 2021, more than a year into the coronavirus debacle <laughs> or whatever that means for you. Um, today, I am absolutely thrilled to be introducing the story of Karen Hill Anton who approached me a couple of weeks ago and I've since started reading her book. So welcome, Karen. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be speaking with you, Sarah. Absolutely thrilled. And um, I, of course, I've been living in Japan for a long time now. So somewhere, Karen has been kind of on my radar, but I've never met her before. So this is our first time to meet and her story is amazing. And you know, I believe everybody has stories and I wanna hear them and tell them. And there are many, many ways to lead a life and what a life we are about to hear about. So, um, okay, I like to just throw in a fun fact before I do the official uh, bio of a person is this. Um, I'm a really slow reader. I also love social media. so. I've kind of let my reading habit slip recently. And I said to um, Karen, I'm gonna order your book so I can just dip into it. And she said, you won't be able to put it down. And she was right. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the beautiful book. It's called The View from Breast Pocket Mountain. And that title itself is so enticing, but it doesn't say anything about the amazing content of this book. And just to give you some idea before I give her a bio, before I got to page 50, Karen had introduced me to her relationship with Joseph Heller, Nana Cherry's dad, and the Steve Miller band. <laughs> and that was just in passing. So I, that gives you some indication of what a, what a rich experience we're about to dip into and what an incredible woman Karen is too. So about Karen. Karen Hill Anton wrote the popular column Crossing Cultures for the Japan Times and Another Look for Chinichi. Shimbum for 15 years. She is a cross-cultural competence consultant and coach. Karen lectures widely on her experience of cross-cultural adaptation and raising four bilingual bicultural children. And she served on the Internationalization in Education and Society Advisory Councils of Prime Ministers Obuchi and Hashimoto. Her work appears in The Broken Bridge, Fiction from Expatriates in Literary Japan by Stonebridge Press. Originally from New York, she's achieved second degree mastery in Japanese calligraphy and has lived with her husband, William Anton, in rural Shizuoka since 1975. Her memoir, The View from Breast Pocket Mountain, has been awarded the Book Readers Appreciation Group medallion, and I can totally understand why. I love it. So Karen, welcome. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. Okay, so I always kick off with this question. Tell us about your background, your childhood and your ancestry. Okay, my background and childhood would, well, begin in New York City. I grew up in the Washington Heights area of New York City. I was raised by my father. Um, he was a single parent because my mother had been institutionalized. And I, I write about this um, in, in the early part of the book in some detail. Um, I, so I, th I think I started out with, well, a somewhat unusual uh, perspective and experience in, in, in as much as my father took over the child raising of three young children. Um, my brother was a year older than I uh, was, my sister a year younger when our mother was institutionalized. So we were three, two and one years old, basically. And um, so I, I certainly started out um, one, uh, knowing that men could do what, what women could do at least to, to some extent, because my, my uh, father, in addition to, to working, also did all of the yeah, yeah, domestic responsibilities in, in a home, uh, which you know, included everything from c cooking and, and cleaning and, and ironing our dresses, because then that was a time when uh, girls wore dresses that needed to be ironed. Um, 
you know, and, and braiding our, our hair, et, et, et cetera. So the, those were uh, my beginnings. My, my father was from the Delta region of Mississippi. He was uh, born, I think it was 1894, 1896, I, I don't remember, and mm -hmm. attended the Hampton Institute, which at that time was one of the few, if not the only um, institutions of higher learning where black people uh, were, were accepted for, and, and also uh, Native Americans. So, um, and, and yeah, in his graduation class I, I, in 1917, uh, I think, yeah, probably a third of the uh, graduating students were uh, Native Americans. Mm. And let's see, um, and, and on my mother's side, her, her uh, family was from the West Indies, from J Jamaica and St. Vincent. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, I've, I've read some of the background of this. It sounds like, an, uh, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned it as an unusual upbringing and perspective and experience. And one of the things that I really love about the way that you tell this story is you tell it quite straightforwardly, I should say, without ever kind of making anybody a victim or making anybody, and, and, the, the, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's right. nothing wrong with stating when that's present, but the way you tell the story feels so empowering to me. I've actually got goosebumps now thinking about it. It feels very, and it fills me with confidence and it fills me with a way to tell stories in a, in a really just very straightforward way. And I, I super enjoyed that about the about the, the opening of the book. But I'm really interested in that story of your mum and dad as well, because he was he was a bit older. I think he was about my age and your mum was quite young when they when they got together. That's a, an interesting, I think you say in the book that there's nobody to ask about that and <laughs> nobody was left to ask. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is an interesting uh, story uh, because my father was 50 when he married my mother and she was 18. Yeah. And of course, growing up, they're your parents, you don't yeah, yeah. You know, really question it or even uh, think about it. But you know, um, as the years went on, and you know, and I be became an, an adult, yeah, I became curious. Mm. But um, whether I'm curious or, or not, uh, I don't think I could have an, an answer to that question. No. And, and there is no one in, in my family. Who, um, well, you know, uh, well, I don't have any family anymore. So start there, but. Um, there, there's no one that could answer that question. That lives in your imagination. Yeah, it's it's interesting when those dead ends appear, isn't it? My grandma also, she used to tell us her mum had died. And then when she was dying, she started to tell the truth that actually she, she'd run away. So it's just, you know, so many families hold these stories and hold them for so long. And then my dad, who's fast, not even his mom, my mom's mom, he was just fascinated with the family history. And he started to kind of dig around, dig around with our American relatives who were the older ones who were left and, mm -hmm. uh, and just try to find out what, what happened to her. So it's, it's, and, and got many different stories, right. names, right. occupations, and eventually followed a line that led him to her. But, um, but she had died, but it led him to the, to the answers. Right. Um, so these, these stories do live there. Do you have any, do you have any fantasies? I, when I say fantasies, I mean, these people and ideas live in our imagination. Mm -hmm. What kind of, and I'm fascinated by imagination as well, actually, Karen, mm -hmm. um, uh, what 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 is what what lives in your imagination there? If that's not too personal a question uh, about them, yeah, actually not much. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you, you'd be surprised. I first of all I tend not to live in the past, and yeah, I wouldn't. I would say burden myself or yeah, um, create yeah anxiety ab about something that isn't really. Um, important to me, and I, I think it wouldn't influence my life in, in, in any any way. So I, I'm I'm really not that concerned. I'm I'm curious. I mean, I, I'd be happy to know, but I I wouldn't go delving or or think, oh, that's why I'm this, this way, uh -huh. or or what if it hadn't been that way? That would that's my life, uh, and. You know, I, as I said, I, I write about it. I uh, was open uh, about it, and, and I've told the reader what I know, which is not much. Yeah. Uh, 
in, in terms of you know how they, they met or the fact that there was such a big age difference. I really do not know. No. Yeah, it's it's it, yeah, it's it's beautifully put in the book actually, and very straightforwardly put in the book. And this, I think, may be your tagline. We don't know yet, but I wouldn't burden myself or create anxiety around things that you don't are not important to you. Right. Sage advice. So, um, what was your dad like? Yeah, and of course, I, I also write about him in uh, to some detail in the book. It's, I mean, it's so lo long ago now that, uh, you know, I, I had um, a relationship with my father, but he was, you know, being the only parent, he was uh, very big in my life. Um, and you know, long after I left home, I, I don't think I did anything, you know, in th those early years, you know, from the time I was 18 I, until my early 20s, where if... I um, yeah made a move or a change or made a decision. It was always you know what what would Daddy think you know or what would he say or what would he advise or you know how might he chastise me uh, uh, for something. But um, yeah, he was he was all important in in my life and uh, yeah, it isn't so much that I had a great respect for him. I I grew up at a time and and he was from an era where there was no, yeah, there was no idea, no thought that a child would disrespect a, an older person. Mm -hmm. you know, and certainly not a, a, a parent um, mm -hmm. that could not be, be imagined. So um, that was, I, I would say the, yeah, the, the base of my uh, relationship. I, I respected my father. Of course, I, I, I loved him. I, 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 I thought he was absolutely everything, you know. Yeah, um, I, yeah he, he filled, um, yeah, my world, really. Yeah. I remember once um, my mother's mother, our grandmother, who was from the West Indian Indies and would go back from time to time and once she um, said, you know, I, I want to take Karen with me the, the next time I go. I was still uh, quite young. I, I, I don't know if I was, I probably in, in still in grade school. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I would like to go, but if you take daddy, <laughs> you know, that, that I, I, you know, couldn't imagine going, you know, that far or going away, away from him in, in, in that way. And she said, no, I, you know, I would, would ju just take you uh, along with me. So I, I, I never went um, to the West Indies. Well, not, not then in any case. Mm, yeah. And you do mention in the book that you used to go and visit your mom um, in the, um, I, I just want to say like institutionalized means, because there's a lot of people who might not, who are younger generations who may not be familiar with that word. Can you just describe yeah, that? Well, to I, yeah, um, I guess you would say it was a mental institution. Okay. Um, but now, that's, and that's the thing too, it, uh, we have to think that this was, yeah, the 40s, uh, I guess, you know, the, um, the mid 40s. And what we would even say now as a mental institution is probably a place where people meet regularly with therapists and, you know, are, you know um, receiving you know, the, the proper medication or, or being, yeah, um, how would you say, you know, encouraged or prepared in, to see if they could re-enter uh, life you know, and society. But I think, you know, part of the, the way when I say institutionalized is that I think she was put in a place and basically that was it. Yeah. From what, from what I under, uh, understand, um, I would, I would doubt very much that she received anything that was called therapy. I, mm -hmm. I think it was more of a place where, you know, she could be kept, she could be uh, held, but not helped. Held, but not helped. Hmm. Interesting. But you used to visit her. Do you remember what she was like? Not, not more than what I wrote about it in the book, because uh -huh. she didn't, um, it was almost, yeah, I would say she didn't really have a personality. So there wasn't, uh, I felt a person that I could connect with in, in any way. 
you know, I certainly couldn't have a conversation uh, with her. Um, yeah, she, I mean, she seemed, you know, a gentle, um, but that word might have a connotation uh, for, for someone, you know, and even for, for yourself, you know, say someone is gentle, maybe the next thing you would say is that they were caring, but she wasn't a caring person. Okay. She, you know, she, she didn't, you know, I, yeah, didn't have that faculty really, I would, would say. All right, so I'd like to kind of move on to the next chapter now. What happens? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm keen to kind of move further into the future here. So mm -hmm. you you were in New York for quite some time. I mean, the open, I don't really want to say what the opening of the book is because it's such a great way to get into the book. Mm -hmm. But um, what happens next? And how do you end up meeting uh, your, uh, your, I don't know, Let, let's take it from here. Where would you like to go from here, Karen? <laughs> okay, well, from high school or? Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, so um, I went to George Washington High School, which is a, a public school in, in New York City at the very uh, northern end, end of Manhattan. And I think it was considered uh, a good school at the time, not, not one of these uh, you know, specialized schools in, in, in any way. I did relatively well. I was far from a standout uh, student, but but I, I did well well enough, but not well enough to have gotten good grades on, on the uh, SATs, the Scholastic Aptitude Test that mm -hmm. uh, uh, prepare you for um, for college and, and and higher education. And in in any case, I I was very interested in in dance at the time. And I, I applied myself to that, though I, I didn't know that, you know, I, I would uh, attempt to pursue a career as a professional modern dance dancer, but, but um, that's what I did. But um, during uh, high school, and this was probably one of, the, I guess, the seminal moments in my um, adolescence, we had a teacher, an absolutely wonderful teacher, uh, Mr. William Spilka, who I, I write about in the book, who introduced us to the, the world of great art. And this was in the senior year of high school. It was the first time uh, this school had this, um, this course in their uh, curriculum, art history. But before that, of course, you know, we had yeah, the typical courses of, you know, mathematics and English and different science courses. And I, I think there was an art appreciation uh, course for something that you, uh, very shallow. But the, this uh, particular course really went uh, quite deep into the, the world of art and started at, you know, at the, the very uh, beginning when yeah, humans uh, began to create art. And so, you know, with cave uh, paintings and Stonehenge and uh, the Venus of, of Willendorf and just what went right through and up until um, modern times. And of course, growing up in, in New York City, uh, much of the great art could be seen at the Metropolitan Museum, at the Martin Art, uh, et cetera. But he often spoke about the great museums of Europe and he, had, he I would say, almost open, not, not so much a Pandora's box, but you, you know, one could start to dream about the Prado or the Louvre, you know, the British Museum. I thought, I, you know, I would like to, to see those one day and, and see the, the, um, the paintings that he, he spoke about at the Rijks Museum. Uh, uh, see them for myself. And when I was 19, I uh, left New York City, T took my first flight, never been on an airplane before in my life, and uh, went, went to Europe for the first time. Mm -hmm. And where did you land the first time? In London. Mm -hmm. London. One of the things I enjoyed reading was that, like, although you'd gone to go to the, like the museums, that was your original idea. That you found you enjoyed wandering more. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, well, I mean, I did go to some museums, but it, it was soon apparent that the the world was, yeah, not more interesting, but 
this is where I, I could learn. This is where I could you know, interact with people of different cultures. This is where you know, I could hear uh, different languages. This is uh, where I could you know, eat foods I never heard of, let alone tasted. There, I mean, there was just so much. I, I mean, what, what, even thinking about it now, I just, the, the word that comes to mind, it was just so rich. I, I, it's a wonder I slept. Yeah, and I could say maybe I barely slept. I, I literally ran around Europe for, for one year. Uh, I, I just couldn't get, get enough. I, and I was hitchhiking. I mm -hmm. was hitchhiking alone. Um, but yeah, I, I traveled the length and breadth of, of Europe that first year. It's amazing to think about doing that now, isn't it? It's just... <laughs> not possible, not possible. Yeah. Someone said to me, "What if you know? What if your daughters, you know, wanted uh, to do that when they were nineteen? And oh, it's, I, I, I would not permit it. It is all I can say. <laughs> like, I would not permit it. It yeah. could, not, could not happen. Yeah." I wonder what happened. There. Yeah, one of my mum's friends, um, her best friend actually, my my brother's god godmother, was also hitchhiked she's a, they're a similar a similar age to you i think mm -hmm. and um she also hitchhiked around europe for a month and just lied to her mom she didn't even tell her mom she said she was doing something else i don't know what she yeah said. right exactly I, i'm sure i didn't tell my father <laughs> i don't think <laughs> no. he would have gra grasped that i know he would not have liked it yeah i wonder what happened when did things become so dangerous i wonder yeah because by the time i was a similar age that was off limits although some people did some people who were really edgy did still yeah. had a go at that but um i did the railing instead like interrailing right. it become more formal by then right and even then i got robbed you know but it's all part of the fun <laughs> yeah. isn't it <laughs> yeah definitely the world's changed it, it, it really has uh, things that yeah were possible even in my lifetime you yeah. know as a young woman yeah. are not possible now, just not possible. I, I wouldn't dream of such a thing now. And as I said, I, if any of my daughters wanted to do that, I, you know, I, I would forbid it. I, I don't know what else to say. I'd lie, yeah. on, the, lie on the tarmac and prevent the plane <laughs> from time flying off, you know, whatever, taking off. Yeah. I can see the front page of the paper now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, you, at, around that time then as well, you met this very kind of flamboyant character uh, who became uh, your first child's father, right? Uh, Don Coleman, Don uh -huh. Coleman. That, that was after I returned uh, from Europe. It was okay. in, uh, 66. And I could say he pretty much swept me off my, my feet. Um, he was a wonderful person in, in, in many ways, very, very intelligent. And as I, I write, He'd been um, recruited from Yale, or yeah, I guess it's just called recruited um, because he was something of a computer genius at a time when, yeah, people didn't know about computers in 66. I mean, as general not knowledge. I mean, now you, you couldn't mention the word com computer now where um, that anyone, you know, it's not only heard of them, but has some familiarity with, with them. But 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 then it, it was really uh, something, and yeah, not novel, but it, it was new, and it, you know, and they were being uh, developed. And apparently, he was uh, very good at it, um, programming, and I forget some something else he, he did. But as I, I mentioned, he, he would have these huge manuals. You can't imagine they were just so large, and you. Know, you know, I mean, the average person couldn't couldn't read them. It, it, it wouldn't make it wouldn't make any uh, sense uh, to them. And uh, and that that was his his work. But it, aside from the, um, his profession, he as a person was someone. Yes, he was it was uh, definitely uh, flamboyant. Uh, and as I I believe I make clear in the memoir, he he was also quite reckless. Yeah. Yeah, that's very clear. Yes, yes. <laughs> very, yeah. I went with flamboyant, yeah. but go, yeah, good. <laughs> but, and, but and within that too, and I don't, uh, you know, I think this is in the book too. There was a certain attractiveness in it because you know, everything was was you know was just excited uh, yeah. around him. No day was like the day before, um, and and you just didn't know 
you know, what would, uh, yeah, what, what you could expect it. And as I said, um, just uh, meeting him, the, the next day we, we flew to Puerto Rico, <laughs> you know, just like that. I mean, I, I, if I say he talked me into it, it, I mean, it wasn't like he twisted my arm or, so, or something like that. Just, uh, yeah, it sounds like, yeah, sure, why not? You know, it's like, of, of course, you know, we'll have a great time and, and um, yeah, I, I, I'm game. I just like, I, I was open to it and so that's what we did. There's this sense of just constantly kind of following what's what's in front of you, like like it, it something presents itself and just following this. I've written down the word wanderlust here because it just feels like that. I don't I don't know. Tell me where I'm wrong. No, I, I, don't, I don't think you're wrong. Um, I, I, I really think that's who I am, you know, yeah. why I'm a, like that. I'm not reckless. You know, I'm not I'm not crazy, but uh, I am open and um, I have been willing to you know, take some risk, not, not uh, again, in any way of courting danger or, right. uh, you know, I, and I certainly wouldn't say I'm edgy, you know, that, that, that doesn't describe me, but I think I've been willing to not just, you know, see what's around the corner, but actually go around the corner, you know, and, 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 and you know, see an experience for, for myself. And, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not afraid. Uh, that's um, probably what I, how I would sum it up. I, I'm just not afraid. Awesome. I, I just want to kind of flag this as well from a coaching perspective. It, you've, 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 you've made a lovely distinction here between courting danger and taking risks are actually two very different things. Very different. So the willingness to take a risk. You can be quite, I'm, I'm willing to take a risk, but I'm sensible. I like to pay my taxes. I like to know that things, okay. I know where my tsunami escape is, you know, because <laughs> yeah. I live by the sea. So, yeah. you know, um, but like that ability to go around the corner and not be afraid, that's something. And not, and not know what's around the corner. Right. I do not know what's there, but, but you uh -huh. know, you'll go in and you'll, you'll see, you'll find out for yourself. Love that. Um, so Puerto Rico, and then you find that you're pregnant, but this is something interesting as well, is you mm -hmm. don't then decide to go and get like a one bedroom flat somewhere and, um, you know, oh. settle into single mother. <laughs> I look at that laugh that's just <laughs> like, a like as if, as if, but a this one bedroom be flat, yeah, no, that's <laughs> But in the normal constraints of a kind of, and perhaps this links back to your, what, by your description an unusual perspective and experience is like that, that the normal way of being in a family, what, that's not even a, a thing for you. I don't know. So you were just like, right. And now we continue with this, this I loved because so many of my clients and my people and my friends are so very, find it so restricting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> They find what mother being a mother. motherhood, right? Yeah, no, I don't. And um, if anything, if anything, I would say motherhood has, yeah, just yeah, helped me blossom. Help, help me, yeah, find um, not not just who I am, but the other people I am. I, I would say that. Um, I didn't think, oh, well, now I, I have a baby. I, you know, I better do this or I better do that. Yeah. Or, or I, you know, I have to stay in this one place. And as I said, I, you know, I, I do find a, a stable life, um, um, a, a wonderful thing, really, a, a lovely thing. And certainly now it's like I've been living, you know, in, in my own home for uh, any number of, of decades. But, yeah, I think having children, experiencing uh, motherhood, really just, uh, again, it's another way to, it opens the, the world uh, to you in, in terms of raising them, what you want them to know, learn, find out about, uh, expose them to, um, how to look after another human being, to see th that they're safe, that they're healthy, um, learning to, to be caring, uh, to yeah, to, to find out your capacity for loving, uh, and I, I believe I, I also mentioned 
mentioned that in the book. And this, uh, again, as, as a young, young woman, I, I don't think I had any inkling of, the, of that really. Uh, and it was through motherhood, through um, having children and raising a family that I, I feel I was able to, yeah, j just a, a blossom in the world in, 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 in a certain way. I, I don't, I, mean, I don't like the word blossom, but I can't think of something else right now. But uh, flourish, thrive. Uh, anyway, yeah. But I never found it limiting. That's the I, I, uh -huh. I want to make it clear. I never found it limiting. Oh, now I have a child. I can't do this. I can't do that. And now I, I never felt that. Never once. Never ever. Never ever. And and or that uh, uh, having a child or having children was holding me back from something, you know, oh, now I can't study or I can't travel or um, I'd really like to, to, to write, for example, but, but um, that, that's not possible. I, if anything, I, I felt and still feel that the responsibilities of, of motherhood, which I uh, fully em embrace, that it, it made it possible for me to really think seriously uh, about what my priorities were, what was important to me, and how I could make those work within the framework of the life I'd chosen. You know, no, no one made me be any, uh, uh, one or anywhere or, or, or do anything. This was a, the life I, I had chosen. And yeah, if anything, I became highly organized. I'm a very organized person. <laughs> and I, I think it's a bit, been a good thing. And, and within that, I've been able to also um, be creative. And I, I couldn't be more grateful. Yeah, and, and another thing that I noticed that it, because uh, I love the cast of characters who come through as well, like that the, at that time when you had your baby and you were in Scandinavia, uh, Denmark, I believe, and then you was in France and all these other different places, it's that they also got, the, the people around you also got to come and play a part or that when you're working at the the college or the, the or in the kitchen high school yeah yeah, yeah that, there, that there was like people who would kind of come in and like they would want to, I mean, this was an interesting thing to me as well. Like you'd put the baby outside, right? Or, or for even in the winter. And then when the baby starts crying, you go out and get them. But like people would run to go and get her. And it's just this sense of having that village and community around you. And I know a lot of my, my mama friends here, I don't have kids, but like a lot of my mama friends here have tried, are trying to create that kind of village for themselves yeah. now, because otherwise, especially with the lockdowns over the last yeah. year, they've become quite isolated. So creating these kind of either in-person or online communities where they do help each other in that way. Because I think we got, that got lost somewhere along the line. It really did. And I think it's so important. I think it's so important, you know, uh, I can tell you, Sarah, so many times when I've read some tragic story in the newspaper uh, about a, a mother who's yeah, committed you know, just to the worst crime or, or com you know, committed suicide or you know, um, hurt, abused a, a, a child, my first thought is, where, where is her community? Yeah. Where are her neighbors? Yeah. Did no one here that you know the a baby you know crying you know throughout the, the night and obviously you know this mother must be yeah at her wit's end or didn't I see her at the store and she just looked exhausted couldn't I just say oh you know you go get your hair done and you know I'll watch your baby for for an hour or two or whatever it is I mean is that we can help and it doesn't it wouldn't it wouldn't cost you anything. I mean, and, and I and I, I I don't mean in, in terms of, of money certainly, but just you know to be able to to let people know that they're not alone, that they're not isolated, that there is help. We're we're human beings. We sh we share this you know our, our earth together, and and certainly within neighborhoods, we should be able to to reach out to, uh, to people. Yeah, it's something I think we need to unlearn and relearn somewhere along yeah. the line because. I think there's also some strange codependence that has emerged in whatever's happened that yeah. 
if you approach somebody, then they feel like they're being criticized as well. Or, you know, so you might say, oh, I think, oh, shall I Just back off? I'm yeah, right, right, right. Oh. Funny. You know, like yeah. It, yeah. it's a terrible thing to isolate parents in that way, I think. Yeah, it um, really is. And in a lifetime. So then you, so I'm going to kind of fast forward a little bit, but you could take it wherever you want to from okay. here is you, you then kind of reconnect with what I would just, in my, I read this as being like the love of your life, like whoops, <laughs> that missed. And then the wonderful Don came into the picture, a uh, beautiful Nanao was, was uh, created. And then you kind of revisited the one. I don't know. So how would you like to take this forward? I'm a hopeless <laughs> romantic. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it, maybe it, it was one of these things. And again, I, I didn't see it coming. I didn't, um, you know, make something happen. And it really is how I, I wrote about it in the book. I, I've been visiting my, my father and um, I had a dream. And I, I woke up and, and I just... So I thought, oh, I haven't seen Billy Anton in a long time. And, and he was a friend, you know, from uh, high school days, uh, a very good friend. And we, yeah, just got kind of like, you know, fallen in, uh, uh, out of touch. And I, I thought um, I, I'll try and uh, get in touch with him. And, and, and I did. And I was like to say the, the rest uh, was history. I don't want to say too much uh, for people who haven't uh, read the book, but. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, um, it again, you know, if I say, you know, you know, I listened to dreams or, you know, I followed my heart or I, I would seem, you know, I had this intuition, oh, he's the one I, you know, should be with. It sounds like, oh, I'm just, you know, <laughs> dreaming, you know, uh, off in my head dreaming all over the time. So it, it isn't really like that, no. but I do tend to listen to my intuitions and, mm -hmm. I, I, they're not always right. Mm -hmm. It's not like you know I, I've not made any missteps or or anything. But I uh, I guess I I give them a chance. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I give them a, ch a chance. And yeah, I, I I yeah I don't have much to regret. What can I say? Yeah, I, I really don't. What, what I see here is like so. Yeah, it's interesting because it's clear you're not like that's not from the book as well you're not like this dreamy character who just kind of follows their intuition and so on okay. um, but what i see is a corner a corner appears so you have a dream and then a corner appears and then you go around the corner <laughs> this is yeah. kind of how i put this together in in my mind so you then uh, long story short you begin a another journey together right. um one of the things that is really big in this is uh, macrobiotic food and food and organic food. And there's a whole, and, um, and this is where the connection to Japan begins. Could right. you tell us a bit about that? Right, well, my husband, um, Billy, William and Anton was one of the very early members of the macrobiotic uh, food uh, movement in, in the um, United States. And, I, yeah, I can remember, I mean, he was still in university when I went to visit him uh, once, you know, we were good, good friends and I went up to, to visit him and it was just after this time when he had embraced the macrobiotics and you know, he was just you know, full of enthusiasm for it and, you know, decided it was the best thing ever. And I remember we were up late uh, talking as we often had and he, was um, sharing a house with uh, two or three r roommates. And at one point, and it was really uh, quite late at night, he held up, a, he went to the freezer. Uh, uh, we were uh, sitting in the, in the kitchen and he went to the freezer and took out a container of ice cream. And I don't know, maybe he had clowns on it or balloons or something like, like that, you know, very, very uh, bright colored. And then he held up a, pressure cooker of brown rice and he said and I can quote him and this is I mean I, I think he was 18 or uh, and I was 17 at the time said um, which one is food which one would you rather eat well, actually said which one would you rather eat 
which one is food. This, this is uh, how he uh, impressed the, upon me that you know, wholesome, uh, unprocessed food, simple food was the, the best thing that you could uh, put, put in your body. I mean, I, and it's, it's not like I became macrobiotic or overnight um, when, when he um, did this. But it, it, it made an impression on me. Yeah. yeah, it's making an impression on me now as well. And, um, you know, it's interesting to note that that kind of that kind of work with your hands mm -hmm. can take you anywhere. Right. If you can write, it takes you anywhere. If you can uh, cook, it takes you professionally and you have the, the will and the, the you know, the the the, the will to, to, to do that. It, it can take right. you anywhere. I recently read a, a, another New Yorker's memoir. And she's a hairdresser and she said, as long as I can stand and hold a pair of scissors, I can do anything. Uh -huh. I can have nothing and I can do anything. And I just, I love that notion that whatever you have, your skill can right. take you anywhere. You know, she was a drug addict, she lost everything, but she says, as long as I can stand with a pair of scissors, I can do anything. And I love that idea. So this this um, cooking and and your your skill and your, uh, your drive and your, your ability to do anything took you wow. across Europe, um, over land. Now, this is where my journey with you has, end, has, has, has paused. I'm going to get back into this and try and finish it this week so I know what's going on. Please don't worry about spoiling the book for me because it's going to be okay. amazing anyway. <laughs> I know you're or, in Japan. Or, yeah, or for people who may uh, yes. read the book. Yes, that's right. So without giving away too much detail, you mm -hmm. arrived in Japan in 1975. Can you fill in a bit of that for us? Right. Okay, well, in 1974, uh -huh. um, Billy and I were living in, in Vermont. Um, right. the, well, so cold, that's all I could think, so cold. <laughs> un unimaginably cold. <laughs> A wet feet oh my god it's so visceral that part was so visceral to me ah yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't do it again i couldn't do it now we're living in shizuoka where we don't we don't even have snow ever no yeah, so um but yeah we were living in, in vermont and he got the invitation to study in in japan macrobiotics um well ma macrobiotics but also um i would say traditional uh, Eastern healing methods like acupuncture, moxibustion, and, and things like that, yeah. and martial arts and yoga at this uh, yoga dojo. Okay. And um, he, he asked, you know, if I would go uh, with him, and I, I basically said, sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, you know, and we decided we would do that. But instead of going straight to Japan, which we could have done, just mm -hmm. flown from New York City or, um, or Boston um, in, into Tokyo, we decided we'd go over land. So we went first to Europe, bought a Volkswagen Bug, and then traveled around Western Europe, you know, through England and Wales and Scotland and Norway, Denmark, Let's see, we're in France. I, I, you know, I almost forget. But then we drove um, straight across northern Italy, um, um, across the former Yugoslavia, country that no longer exists, yeah. to Bulgaria, to, um, Turkey, Iran, and Afghanistan. And then we took public transportation through Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Thailand. So, and arrived in Japan on June 1st, 1975. Amazing. How old was your daughter at this point? She was five. Five, I mean, with a five-year-old, I mean, that that's an incredible journey on its own, but with a five-year-old in tow, yeah. it just makes me feel like you've really ignited a little flame inside of me to, I don't know, just to follow my curiosity a little bit more. Mind you, my curiosity leads me to these interviews. So um, yeah, a, a lot uh, of people, a lot of people who who read the book, uh, that's what what they, they say. That, yeah, that they feel, oh, okay, yeah, if, you know, I can do that, or yeah. it's okay to even still want to do that, yeah. or I may still do that. Yeah, that that it, it's possible. Yeah. It's actually possible. Yeah. Okay. So you arrive in Japan, and again. Like, what was your, did you have any plan at that point? Did you know what was going to happen? Did, no. 
So, uh, so you haven't yet um, um, read the part about the dojo, but th th this, this um, experience of, of studying martial arts and traditional Eastern healing meth methods and yoga, um, et cetera, was the program was for one year because his, uh, his scholarship was for one year. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I write about the dojo experience in some detail. And mm -hmm. I, I hope you'll enjoy that chapter when there are actually several chapters when you come to that. But after it was over, and because it was really a very strict and proscribed in, in environment, um, we just realized we barely glimpsed Japan. You know, we were in the dojo that was, you know, our, our, our life. And Where was the dojo, Karen? Which part of it? In, in, in um, Shizuoka Prefecture in, in, in Mishima. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we, well, we just said, you know, let's stay a little longer. Yeah. 46 years ago. Yeah, 20 years for me. So <laughs> there you have it. Yeah. You're my, you're my grandmaster. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's like I came yeah. for a year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you have it. Yes, yeah. like the famous last words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so grateful as well. I love it here. You know, yeah. has it? I, I know it. I know her flaws, but yeah. I'm also happy yeah. to be but here. Some things, yeah. Some things that are not planned still work out. Yeah. Well, there, there you have it. In any case, yeah. I, after the dojo, um, yeah, we wanted to stay in Japan, but. We knew we didn't want to be in one of the large cities. We, we didn't want to live in Tokyo or Kyoto or Osaka, um, any place like that. And we were able to decide on this area, which, which is where we still live, uh, Shizuoka, north of Hamamatsu, mm -hmm. uh, when my husband found work in, in the city of Hamamatsu. And yeah, we, we found a farmhouse and that's Breast Pocket Mountain. It's called Futokoro Yama. And that's from how I yeah, yeah, came up with, with the title for the book. Futokoro Yama. It's, if I look out my window <laughs> and look, yeah, let's see, from here it would be west, northwest. Uh, 20 minutes up the road is, is where uh, we lived for seven years in an old uh, farmhouse, traditional farmhouse, um, quite rustic. No Is it this back. one? That, that's it. Yes. Okay, so it's on the it's on the sleeve of the it's on right. the sleeve of the book, the cover of the book, I should say. Right. Yeah, right. that looks absolutely like that. Just looks magical to me. That looks like something like out of my imagination or out of a it is, I mean, it, it, Miyazaki it film. Magical, but it was also uh, quite isolating. <sighs> Yeah, I'm really, really isolated. Um, our neighbors, all, all of our neighbors were, were farmers. Um, there were no, well, certainly no, no, no foreigners or anything like that. But, but there, but there weren't even you know people to spend time with or socialize or anything like that. I, I spent a lot of time alone, and for the most part, it, it wasn't a, a problem. But after seven years, uh, um, it became uh, too much. How did you get through that time, Karen? How did you manage that time? Uh, uh, food? No, how did you manage that time? Uh, how did you get through? Uh, how did you get through? through? Oh, I'm sorry, oh, like, how did I get through? Yeah, I just, um, yeah, my own inner reserves, um, you know, um, I, I, again, I, it wasn't like I was forced to be there. You know, I, I, I loved it. It was a beautiful place. It was a wonderful place to, um, raised children. Our second daughter was born while we were there. Our son was was born there. Um, it, it, you know, if you saw it, well, you can see part part of it. You know, uh, from looking at, at the uh, back cover of the book, but it was just you know a panorama of idyllic. Yeah, tea bushes and bamboo and you know forests and woods. And it was really beautiful and. You know, you could literally see forever because we were so high up. Mm. Um, so, you know, I was living in a, in a really wonderful environment. It's just some, sometimes, or for some people, the environment is not enough. And, no. Yeah. And when my fourth uh, daughter was born or about to be born, I, I realized, 
yeah, we've done this enough. It, it, it isn't working. But all, and also we were far from the city where Bill was working and um, he was driving over an hour every day to work and then over an hour back. And yeah, you know, uh, it, it wasn't, let's say it wasn't helpful to our relationship to say the very least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah it was testing. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's interesting because I'd love to go in that not into your relationship a bit more, yeah. but it just must have been so like a little place like that in the mountains. Like, I mean, my my I, I'm in a uh, mixed relationship. My husband's Japanese. That's why my surname's Furuya. Uh -huh. The listeners, they probably know that already. But, um, you know, we have our family has a, a farm down in Hyogo Ken in the deep Inaka, which means countryside. Right. Uh -huh. Beautiful. And we have flirted with the idea of going down there and doing something with it. But I know like 10 seconds later, I just know that that would be a one way trip for me <laughs> to, 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 to crazy town because oh, okay. <laughs> the sadness, like I, I, like I like to have at least some people around me kind right. of thing. And also that we would just be such an incredible curiosity in those towns. Now, speaking of a curiosity, these two Americans kind of land in this super isolated place in the Shizuoka countryside. Like, what was like from the perspective of being there's a there's a there's an interesting experience of being a foreigner in Japan. It's just part of being here, right? We can right. be part of the fabric of the society, but it's it could be the knot you tie on the back or that stitch that sticks out a bit on the tapestry. I don't know how exactly to describe it or where you ran out of the right color. So you went for one that was just close enough, but you can still right. tell, I don't know how to describe it, but right. how was that being these kind of like boom, people in the in the local local community? Literally a plop down in the middle of a uh, farming community. And as I say in the book, I don't know what made us think we could uh, make a life there, but we did. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I would never say we, we were never a curiosity because these were farming people. These were country people. They, uh, um, they may have been curious a, a, about us, but it wasn't like, uh, you, you know, uh, you can only see them from afar. It's a community. So, you know, there were always community um, yeah, chores and things you needed to participate in and, and um, yeah, you know, even if it was just you know the the, the summer festival or what, whatever it, it, it was, but yeah, um, yeah, I I can't say how how they uh, perceived yeah. it because you know, it, you know it's from their perspective, but uh, yeah, I ju I just feel we were able uh, to, to make a life there, you know, uh, somehow. Of, of course, we were unusual. We were different. Um, I also write about the fact that our uh, first daughter born here didn't speak English. Yeah, and we were concerned that she wouldn't speak Japanese because we don't have uh, any uh, Japanese family mem members or, or, or relatives and didn't know at the time that um, children will naturally speak the language of the country where they, they live. I, I would have had to go out of my way for her not to speak Jap Japanese. So she, uh, she did, and because, you know, we were just so different, I, we didn't want to put any pressure on her to speak our language. You, you know, um, children can, yeah, I think become really self-conscious, you know, especially once they're in school, you know, their parents show up for the PTA meeting or the, you know, the meeting with the teacher. And then, you know, they see their child in the schoolyard and start speaking to them in English. And, you know, the kids want to look away, like, you know, I don't know who that strange person is or whatever. Yeah, so we, we just um, decided to, to let her uh, speak uh, in Japanese. I always spoke to her in English. She always answered, answered me in, in Japanese and, and just, just the way we did it uh, right up until she was in junior high school. Mm, mm, mm. I'm seeing uh, this unusual continuum because <laughs> you, everything's unusual, right? Even from when you were born, everything was unusual. It's almost like, like what, what, what even it, it, that's the norm. 
and, and I'm loving it. I'm, I'm really, I don't know, something's settling in for me here. So I'm going to keep digesting it and ask you to, to, to tell me what, what happens next. So you've got, is it four or five children? I, I have four children, three daughters yeah. and a son. Uh-huh. And so you moved out of the uh, Breast Pocket Mountain and then moved, what, further into the, into the town? Yeah, we moved into the city of Hamamatsu. Mm-hmm. Where you live now? Um, this is now considered the city of Hamamatsu because they, um, what they merged, uh, uh, you know, Gapeshta, you know, the, um, Tenryu be, uh, was absorbed, <laughs> I don't know what to say, by Hamamatsu. And no, no doubt because of you know, these areas are depopulated. Mm -hmm. But uh, we live actually in, in the, what was the city of Tenview when we were still at Breast Pocket Mountain. That was considered, that was called the city of Tenview. Mm -hmm. But I, can, I assure you, it's not a city uh. <laughs> not a, a, at all. And, and even, um, you know, now we live in a, a residential subdivision or uh, we'd say Jutaku Danchi. Mm -hmm. single family homes but if I drive 10 minutes into the little town here uh, there is no bookstore there's no supermarket now that there, there used to be uh, there's certainly nothing like a cinema um, I can I almost could only tell you all of the things that it doesn't have because it, it, there there isn't any, any even that it, that it really does have so when did you start writing in earnest I, I probably, I would say when the, I started publishing in, in earnest, when I began writing first for the Chunichi Shimbun and th then later for the Japan Times. But I had been, been writing, I would say most of the time I was at uh, Futokuroyama at Breast Pocket Mountain. It was yeah, one of the things I did. Um, I would, yeah, I didn't have a typewriter. My husband would borrow a typewriter from a friend in town and bring it home. And I type up anything I'd written over the weekend and take it back on on Monday. That that's what I did. what I did. In fact, I the typewriter that I'm typing at there on the cover of the book is one of those typewriters that he borrowed. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'm just showing the cover of the book now, just mm -hmm. in case anybody's watching this on YouTube. Okay, um, I really be I love this. Uh, I love this little specter in the background. Right. That that's, your that's our, yeah, that's our daughter Mia. She was, uh, and if you look closely, you can see she has uh, an angry look on her face because probably I told her to go away or something while I was that's writing. Funny, because uh, I. I, I I, I read that as little you hanging around somehow, but yeah, no, that's that's uh, we can all have an imagination. <laughs> um, good. Um, so then, tell, bring us up to date. Then, like, what what does life look like, or is there anything in between that you think I should I should know here, or what's it like? Like, it just seems so you've integrated so easily into. I don't know if it's, I don't know if, if integration is exactly the right word. I think it mm -hmm. kind of is. We don't assimilate. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, it's it's not integration, it's not assimilation. I'm really, you know, I I, I don't know that I've ever named it. Let's just just no. you know, yeah. yeah. I, I, I feel that um, yeah, we were able to settle here, to settle. create a home here, to raise a family here, to uh, to work here. Um, and and this is the situation <laughs> that we're in. Yeah. Maybe we, we could be in Norway. I, I, I honestly do, do not know, but it happens to, to be in rural J Japan. And yeah, now, now this, this is my normal. Yeah, what can I say? Yeah. What, so how would you describe your relationship mm -hmm. with Japan? To, uh, to Japan, to the country, to the people. Uh, yes, one of those, or like yeah, to Japan yeah. herself, or to, to, um, yeah, like, yeah, I often think about I this, yeah. um, it's just, yeah, I talked about with this with the last interview I did as, a little bit as well, but yeah. This is, well, this is home. Yeah. I mean, this is home, um, and it's the home 
we've created. Yeah. And so it's the place where I'm most comfortable. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I never talk about love of country. It's yeah. just something I, I, I don't uh, do. Uh, no. I love people. Uh -huh. But I, I, I don't uh, speak of that. But that is not to, to say that um, I find so much that is wonderful here, so much that I enjoy, so much that I've benefited from in terms of my own uh, personal development. Um, there's so much I appreciate about Japan, really uh, d deeply, of course, the culture. And um, I, I, as, as you know, I've studied uh, calligraphy and that, that's opened a, a door on a, on a particular uh, aspect of, of Japanese culture uh, for me that, yeah, it has, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a passion uh, of mine. I absolutely love uh, calligraphy. But yeah, it's, I think more than, um, yeah, it's not more than that, but it's a Japanese way of living that I, I just appreciate so, so much. There, there's so much calm and order and the lack of chaos that I see so, in so many places in the world that uh, I, I embrace it. I, I, I must say, I, I totally embrace it. I, and and it goes without saying, Japan isn't perfect. You know, there are many uh, ways it, it can improve. As anyone who's read my columns, uh, where I would often write um, columns that were critical of some aspect of Japan, particularly the, the education, um, style of education, I, I, I would say, uh, I, I, I wrote a, a lot about that. but. Yeah, overall, I, I think um, Japan has got a, a lot right. It, it, um, it has um, create a, a, created a, a wonderful society in, in many ways. And I often think that if, um, yeah, if people were more, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how to say this, um, almost valued themselves as highly as they appear to, you know, value their society and uh, work, for, for example, I, I, I feel th this would practically be a, a, a paradise. And, mm. um, you know, I, I've also worked in, in the corporate world and as a coach. And one of the things I, you know, have to, to tell people, Japan cannot be proud of the fact that it has uh, a word and probably the only country in the world that has a, a word for death from overwork. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Karoshi, it's, um, it's not, it's, it's not a, a, a good thing. And, 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 I, and I feel, well, and now with the pandemic, I, I think people are, have started to see and certainly companies have, have started to see, well, actually how we've been working it's not, not, uh, not only is it not the best way, but there are other ways. And some of those other ways are actually better and more productive and more effective. And, you know, we, we do not have to use up our in employees. So we, we, yeah. Can, we can, yeah, you know, we can be better. We, we can um, work with our, our employees instead of just having them work for us beautifully put my my husband um left his job earlier uh, uh mid pandemic last year because again the demands that were being put on him were just really in fact they were forcing him to go to shizuoka from sushi yeah. all week and he just went do you mind if i leave my job <laughs> and i was like no go ahead <laughs> oh, so good yeah so um you know um so then I invited him to join my business and start to clean that up on the back end a little bit because, you know, he's really good at that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So much to unlearn, Karen. 
so much to unlearn and it was a it was you yeah. know Japanese companies that he'd worked for throughout and it's it's a great shame it's a waste yeah for and um you know he's he's a brilliant talented lovely man but just so I don't know how to describe it but yeah what you've just said there like um and, and as a coach as well, you know, I'm, uh, I've just booked us in with a different coach because otherwise I take over all the time. <laughs> you can imagine, can't you? So um, coaches need coaches. And so that not not a therapist or a counselor or anything uh, like that. Right. A coach a coach yeah, no, it's to set up our kind of union together and how we can kind of achieve the dreams that we want to achieve in the future right. without, you know, battling, battling it too right. much. Um, and especially me bulldozing him because he's a lot more introverted than me. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, I'm a bit, I feel sad about that. Yeah. I'd say angry, but it's not angry. It's just sad. I feel so, I just think like, oh, wow, they didn't let you shine. Something like that anyway. Well, well, you're still relatively young and I don't know your husband's age, but you know, it's still so much, you know, you can accomplish it. and. and how wonderful he was able to make, make this change. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so and, oh, there was one more question I want to ask you here. And this is a difficult mm -hmm. question because it's almost a wordless answer, I think. Yeah, sure. said calligra calligraphy opened a door to Japanese culture. Now I hear this a lot mm -hmm. um, about any, uh, um, I was talking to um, Chuck Johnson, who was one of my previous um, people. And he was talking about how he learned kimono mm -hmm. and how that also like, it's a similar, I, I would hazard to say that any of the really traditional arts of Japan require this. There's something. Can you describe what, uh, that, what you meant yeah, by that? Yeah. Um, I mean, in just so many ways, first, first of all, just the relationship that you have that it's not even that it's created, but it's, it's already in place really. And, and you have to fit into it. Uh, but this relationship with a sensei, you know, that, you know, um, the regard that they're held in, what, what you, I would say early on realize that they have a knowledge an ability, a skill to, to impart uh, to you. And that the best thing you can do is to be a devoted student and but of course, you, that that could also, uh, you know, become, you know, warped it, and and I, I felt that that's what had had happened at the dojo with the, the martial arts study. But with uh, my original uh, calligraphy teacher, and and you, you'll come to that um, chapter in the book, he didn't even talk. <laughs> he didn't explain to say, oh, this is how you do this, or this is you know. Uh, the way you should hold the brush or, you know, the ink should be rubbed to this thickness. We really had to look, watch, pay attention and mm -hmm. observe him and apply yourself in you know, the, the deepest sense of, of those, those words that uh, it wasn't going to be an instruction of you know, follow this, you put your, you know, your brush here and you do that. And then you, um, you, you know, then go to the next stroke in, in this way. It was literally watching him at, and seeing this perfect flowing really of the brush and how the strokes were made. It was almost as if there, there weren't, there wasn't another way for it to be. And, and that's what, you know, we were, were striving for um, a, a, as students. It's, it's a wonderful um, practice. Uh, what can I say? I, I, I did achieve uh, Nidan uh, and it um, took many, many years. I, I uh, was studying for, uh, I guess, 25 years uh, anyway. And I could have gone on to study for the third degree uh, Sandan when you're, when you'd be able to teach if you uh, have Sanda, but I can't imagine <laughs> I would want to teach calligraphy in Japan. Mm -hmm. 
And since we're, we're not uh, leaving here, I, I just didn't see that there was any point to continue to study, but I, I, do, I do still write. I, I, I write regularly. Beautiful. Yeah, there's, there's something, there's probably a word for that flow state you mentioned there in Japanese. Do you know if there's a word for that or is it just a wordless? Yeah, if there is a, a word, um, I really don't know what, what it is, but I, I, I do know that in order to, to write, and I, it's not even so much like write well, but just to be able to write, you really have to focus, you really have to concentrate, you know, and I, I think some people, well, many people have said to me, oh, it just looks so relaxing and that you're just, you know, <laughs> just using the pressure, whatever. It is, yeah, especially if you, if we were writing, you know, for an exhibition, you might write uh, 50 characters of a 60 character piece and get to the 51st one and you make a mistake and that's that, you gotta start all over again. That, 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 that's all, I mean, there's no correcting it or anything like that, but yeah, but that's the kind of dedication that I, I think it requires. And if you enjoy it, as I do, then you, you apply yourself to it. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's very telling of Japanese kind of roots, but also I think it's telling of something that um, you can relearn that kind of, that you say dedication or devotion as well. And the regard for sensei, that regard yeah. reminds me a little bit of what you were saying earlier about that inherent respect that you had for your dad um, as just part of that generation. It really is. And another thing I would say too, in terms of um, the opening a door or, or, uh, onto Japanese society and, 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 and culture, when I was doing corporate training and coaching, one of the areas that I worked with people in was a sort of communication. Mm -hmm. And you know, many Japanese would, would say, and of course they're known not to be assertive in, in, uh, in communication and in, within the Japanese context, it was not required, but you know, working for some of these companies where, yeah, the CEO would fly in from New York or London or, you know, wherever and, and gather the people around, you know, for a, a, a once in, in a, not once in a lifetime, but you're not going to have the, this meeting with the CEO on a regular basis. They expect people to speak up. Yeah. And give opinions, ask questions, uh, express uh, doubt about, about things, disagree, and, and they couldn't do, do any of that. And very often they would tell me, oh, Karen, but you don't know as a Japanese, you know, we, we can't do that. And, you know, because of our relationship with, you know, people who are in, in a higher, you know, uh, position or, or, or status, this, you know, is impossible. And, and I understood, I, I understood well, but I said, but it's possible to make that switch to change just for the, for, for this time even, and that it could be a, a benefit to you. Maybe, maybe you've been over, overlooked when you should have been uh, promoted, or, uh, you know, who knows, it, it, it could be helpful to speak up. And I would use the example I, that um, when I, in my calligraphy class with my teacher, everything about me changes. I'm no longer, you know, the American woman who is, you know, speaks loudly and walks with a wide stride or, or, or whatever it is. Your head's a little bit bowed. You, you lower your, your voice, you, you sit seiza um, until you, <laughs> you can't do it any, any, anymore. And just the, interaction with, with the, the sensei completely changes. And, and that's what that environment required. Yeah, it's, it, it, one has to humble oneself to the, to the situation, yeah. I think. And that goes both ways, even, even, even though 
assertive communication doesn't necessarily sound humble. You have yeah. to humble yourself to that style of communication and back the other way. We're quite the chameleons, aren't we? <laughs> in our, uh, you know, <laughs> the way that we we move through the world. Lovely. Um, so, Karen, what's next for you? I'd like to land now. What what's what's next? What's your next ambitions as you enter your seventy six well, well, year? Yeah. I, I've been asked, you know, what's my next project? And, and I, I never speak about that because it, I, I feel it has a way of making things not happen. Okay. Uh, but I usually, um, yeah, I have something that I'm um, planning or, or that I want to do. And once it's uh, become clear to me how, how I'll begin it, then I'll begin. But on, and, and that's just in, in terms of my writing and my professional life. But like everyone else, I'm waiting for this uh, plague <laughs> to be over so we can travel. It's, I, that's um, been very, yeah, d difficult just because I, it's something I enjoy yeah. so, so, so much. And, I don't want to complain too much because I know people have, you know, had some very uh, difficult uh, circumstances, and I, I, I'm one of the, the fortunate ones to to have a home and to to be away from the, the city and not, not concerned really uh, uh, about that. Yeah, it, that we. And and I I have to be careful in saying this that we might contract it, but because I know it's everywhere, really. But we are really so far uh, removed that it it's been comfortable. It it hasn't been you know a yeah a, a real yeah you know, task or something really difficult for us. Not to mention, I I was already living like this isolatedly. Uh, n not the same as living on Breast Pocket Mountain, but but still, this is uh, I'm pretty isolated, so uh, I'm used to it. And just yeah, being able to spend time with family and friends, and I I know some people have said, oh now that they've gone through this, they'll know what's really important: spending time with, with, with family and friends. I already knew that, so um, I will just re resume uh, that life. Beautiful. Where would be your first port of call when you are like able to travel? Either Israel or Portugal, Spain, and Greece. Huh. Okay. Um, another quick question. Your children, where do they live? Okay. Our eldest daughter lives uh, outside of... New York City on, on the uh, Atlantic coast, the, in the Hamptons. I don't know if she, yes, you know, yes. she, she lives there. Our second daughter, yeah, second and youngest uh, daughter, both live in, in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, both directors at um, major companies there. Mm -hmm. And our son is in Kyushu. Oh, I love Kyushu. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do too, especially, well, now the, the uh, cherry blossom season is over, but the cherry blossoms there seem to be something different yet than, okay. than, than in other places. You know, they're really, really beautiful. Yeah, great stuff. And, you know, it's, um, my mum is a similar age to you and had me at a similar age to you had your first daughter. And I think uh, it's just so lovely. We have so long with you. So, you know, like I have friends who are the similar age to her because, you know, when we're in Japan, we just end up with this really like very diverse group of friends. Right. Oh, right. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I just think it's such a treat that we get so long with you when you have uh, when people have kids uh, young. Um, I would love to close out then by asking you if there's any chance you could read a little excerpt from your book for us. Sure, I'd be happy to. It's been such a treat, Karen. Thank you so much. What a, what a fabulous journey. And I'm sure the listeners are just like, what just happened? What a buffet. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, um, okay. I will read uh, from this 
uh, part of the book where I speak about my life in Japan as a mother. Gorgeous. In Japan, I felt that a mother is not just a private role within one's family, but a public one as well. There were ways you were expected to behave, speak, and yes, dress. All news to me as my mothering style, reflecting my general lifestyle, could probably have best been described as free wheeling. One of the few times I rebelled against what I saw as insufferable conformity was when I wore a beige dress to our daughter's elementary school graduation. I knew I'd been told all the mothers would wear black. I'm sure it seems like a small thing, but when you see that graduation photo, it's obvious I was announcing loud and clear, I'm a rebel. I not only march to my own drummer, but the last thing I will do is what everyone else is doing, just because that's how it's done. Uh, that was the early me. I later fell in line, at least to some extent. Lest my children pay the price for my showing up at PTA meetings and on open school days, not as their mother, but the foreign woman who was obviously different. I had to stop with my, I'm doing my own thing stance. The first thing to go were my dangling earrings. Later, the long skirts I'd bought in India were the only worn at home. I remember our daughter telling me that when I go to PTA meetings that I should be sure to dress like the other mothers. Innocently believing I blend in. I showed up dutifully, making no effort to blend in, just not stand out. And I had to learn that as a mother, there are always duties and no escape, nowhere to run or hide when my card came up. Although it took years for this to sink in, I did come to see that it was impossible to live in a Japanese community and not accept this basic fact. Your turn will come. Every time I was told that I'd been selected for yet another committee, my first reaction was, and without fail, no way. But this was followed and with lightning speed by the realization that it was my turn. I wasn't even dreaming of actually saying, no, I won't do it. I got to know local women, other mothers, through our many community activities. These neighborhood women were the same ladies I once got together with for a bonenkai, a year-end party. I've been to many Japanese parties and the simplest thing I can say is we just don't mean the same thing when we use that noun. But this particular party turned out not to be just a fun get together, but a total blast. <laughs> Housewives and mothers one and all, our women only party was a potluck dinner. And it was a delicious, if somewhat mixed bag feast of pizza, fried oysters, salads, baked stuffed fish, and chocolate cake. I was the only one to bring a traditional dish, oden. Simple and what I'd fed the family before going to the party, this clay pot stew of fish cakes was eaten up immediately. Do you have any dance music? Someone asked me after someone else had put on music that had the refrain, Popeye the Sailor Man. <laughs> dance music? I couldn't conceive of a party without dance music. I was home and back in a flash with LL Cool J, Hammer, Tina Turner, Salt and Pepper, Marvin Gaye, and Prince. I put on the cassette and within minutes, the fluorescent lights were turned off and someone plugged in a thing that looked like a crystal ball and stood on a chair twirling a flashlight while calling out, let's disco. <laughs> with a lot of loud laughing and talking, it got positively boisterous. There was sweating, taking off of sweaters and general letting down of hair. And well, they could, there wasn't a man in sight. We could never act like this if our husbands were around, my neighbor said. They just wouldn't like it. And we'd never feel so comfortable. And even if our husbands pretended to enjoy it, you can be sure they'd complain about it the next day. 
Anyway, we wouldn't be comfortable acting like this around her. Considering the degree to which they were letting it all hang out, I asked her if they didn't feel pent up all year long. After all, year-end party means just that. Oh, no, no, no. Our husbands expect us to be meek, quiet, and well-behaved, and we're used to it. It's no problem. I couldn't have been more different from these women. What they could accept in their marriages, I would have found not just stifling, but unbearable. Yes, we were very different, but here we were, women on the loose, escaping mothers, housewives gone to hell, partying our butts off. Like I said, it was a total blast. Oh, I love it, Karen. <laughs> And that was a total blast. And that was just, you've just taken us through a kind of a boot camp of Japanese culture there. And uh, nothing is as it seems and everything is waiting to be discovered. Um, love it, love it, love it. And um, MC Hammer, that was my first dance at my wedding. because oh, oh, <laughs> My husband and I found it really hard to take ourselves seriously. So that's what it was, but it just instantly brought an amazing amount of joy into the room. As you have today, Karen, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a, a joy, a treat. Um, I would recommend, I, I'm going to have a date on that sofa now with this book. Okay. <laughs> I would really, really recommend anybody get hold of it by the, f we, we haven't mentioned what happens in the first page, but you will be hooked from the first page. Karen was not wrong when she said that. I feel like I've just had the greatest mentorship in how to lead my life in Japan. Already, I know that, you know, I will never blend in, but I don't essentially need to stand out in the situations where I don't need to stand out. Okay. And it's just, it, there's just such an incredible amount of wisdom, but not sage wisdom, not kind of showing wisdom. And I, I absolutely loved you taking us on this journey. Please get Karen's book. It's so good. It came to me really quickly through um, uh, Amazon. If that's your, you know, if that's, if that's something you don't like to use Amazon, please try and find a different place to get it. It's In Japan, it's also at Kino Kunia. Oh, is it still, it's at Kinokuniya as well. So go to Kinokuniya and buy it if you want to do an in-person thing, if you're ready for in-person shopping now. Um, as you can see, I've got it well marked here with all these different things. And I wish I could ask Karen to just read each piece here. <laughs> I'd be happy to. <laughs> well, mate, that could be another podcast. I need to let you go now, but everything and just about being a woman in the world and a person in the world and the way you talk about motherhood I think it's going to be so useful to so many people who I work with so I thank you so much Karen for thank coming on so today much, it's been a pleasure yeah and um <laughs> there are many ways to lead a life Ta-da! <laughs> and um everybody has stories and it's my great honor and pleasure and and humble humble duty to tell them for you so Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. You can find Karen at, where do we find you, Karen? Karen? KarenHillAnton.com. KarenHillAnton.com. And that's where she, you can find out the news and where to buy the book. So thank you so much again. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>